Hi everyone, um, I hope you can hear me well, um, and um, I don't know if the microphone is really useful, um, but I, I guess I'll, I'll keep it for the moment. Um, I'm Sabine Fletcher, I'm your host tonight, um, Chapter Director of Startup Grind here in Munich. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the concept of Startup Grind. I started um, in Silicon Valley in um, 2010 and now exists basically in 200 cities and 98 countries. And what we try to do um, at Startup Grind is um, really nurture the entrepreneurial ecosystem, bring founders, investors, um, educators, innovators together um, to help the ecosystem build great company. Um, as the chapter uh, director of Munich, I'm focusing, of course, on the, our local community and uh, I'm organizing monthly events um, for you guys, for people coming from corporates, first-time entrepreneur um, students, as well as inv investors, um, so that they can learn from great stories, uh, great um, individual adventures and journey from uh, from entrepreneur. Um, but that's all for Startup Grind, because I think um, what we are very uh, excited uh, tonight to, to welcome on stage is a, is a female entrepreneur. Uh, why female entrepreneur? Because um, at Startup Grind, our uh, May is our female founder, so across 200 cities you're going to have uh, 200 great events um, for bringing on stage uh, successful and inspiring um, female founder. And um, today I have uh, um, the uh, great joy to welcome uh, not only a successful entrepreneur, uh, but someone who has a pretty inspiring career, but also an inspiring uh, um, family and, and, and uh, personal um, adventure. Um, uh, Tanya uh, Tuvatek, um, welcome on stage. So, so Tanya, just uh, uh, for, to give you a little bit of, a, of, a, of an info, um, was the, the, the co-founder um, uh, behind Netmom uh, that day, one of the Largest German portal for uh, parental and, and for, for parenthood. Um, after six years at McKinsey, four kids, um, and now um, I think on the first of June, becoming the COO of uh, Bora Four, one of the biggest publishing companies in Germany. So uh, maybe a little bit uh, ahead. <laughs> Congratulations on all this. Thank you. Uh, great milestone. Yeah. Thank you. So tell me, how, how it all started? Are you actually originally from, from, from Germany? I heard that actually you were born in the US, if I'm not mistaken. That's true. I was born in the States and uh, moved to Germany when I was four or five years old. That's true. correct. And you, your parents are German or your parents are, are mixed? Okay. My mother is German and my father is American. Okay. So from the beginning on, you had a very international exposure. Um, did, did that help you to get inspired about entrepreneur, or how did you get to be exposed to this to this idea of uh, I would like to form my my company at some point? I think it started at university because my parents both are not really entrepreneurs. My father is a complete hippie who, sometime in his life, realized that he had to work to. So part of family and my mother basically um, went to university, got a degree in chemistry and a PhD and worked at university most of the time. So entrepreneurship was far away from my family. From a, like a researcher and, and a hippie? <laughs> yeah. Interesting mix. And do you have any brother and sister who could have um, exposed you to these to this entrepreneurial activities? No, actually, I have um, half sisters and brothers because I have a typical American family with several divorces <laughs> and uh, all kinds of different children from different marriages. So, a big patchwork family. We actually go on holiday together. All together? Almost all, yes. And that's how many people? 14. Wow, okay, impressive. So, hippie family. I guess <laughs> the value of a family comes from, from, from that, that, mm -hmm. that time and that crowd. And but a certain tolerance. And, for sure. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for each other. I guess you were uh, fighting over food at, uh, at uh, lunch breaks or dinner. <laughs> um, but so, what, where did this, did this entrepreneurship come from? This interest to, to, to be your own boss, basically? Mm -hmm. Basically, it started at university. I studied at the WHU, which um, is basically um, a university that brings out a lot of founders. And um, a lot of my friends were thinking about what could we do, what could we found, 
it's part of the university uh, studies there that you have courses thinking about that. And I think that first, at the first time, really planted the idea that that might be an interesting move to basically build something on, on your own. And then I started my career at McKinsey because I basically had no clue what I wanted to do after my studies. And that like seemed like of the consultant I have. <laughs> so the in the <laughs> and then I got pregnant at McKinsey and said, well, that's definitely not a career I want to follow with kids. And founding a company seemed like a great adventure you could do with kids. <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> well, I, I guess um, having kids is already a, a big adventure and, yeah. and an entrepreneurial uh, one because I guess you don't have any experience about this when you have your first kid. So at the same time of um, you know being pregnant with your first daughter, I think, mm -hmm. you uh, had the idea of, of netmom that day. How, how did that, I mean, I, I, can, I can see the, the relationship between the mm -hmm. two, but how did you actually um, figure out that this was the idea you wanted to construct and you wanted to build for the next couple of years? Actually, we first of all made the decision to found a company and then we looked out for ideas and NetMoms was an idea that, I mean, for sure, you know, was at that time somehow very close, but we also thought about other ideas, so it would have been possible that we would have done something completely different. And by saying we, you were with uh, your co-founder, uh, Jens. Jens, actually we were three founders. Ah, okay. Yes, um, but then uh, one of the founders dropped out after six to nine months. Okay, so pretty pretty early in the fun foundation mm -hmm. of your company. Yeah. So as a normal consultant, you basically went out and looked for the best business case um, that you could think of, mm -hmm. uh, a successful one, and then NetMom um, came up as, as a potential I'm idea. Actually, not so sure if we really... We that's interesting for a consultant, but it was not really an analytical decision okay. that we made because it's not... It was just something that we were convinced that is a need in the market where we really saw um, that we could solve a problem. And we actually were that need, actually, mm -hmm. as, yeah. as a first end user. Yes, yeah. exactly. Because actually everybody laughed at us when we said we're going to make a community for moms. Um, I actually went to university once and um, the professor who um, has the entrepreneurship um, part at the university was laughing at us and was saying in public, you know, this is never going to be a business. So, well, we'll see. <laughs> so. And because I am I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the consultant analytic work, uh, because I've interviewed quite a few entrepreneurs who also come from, you know, um, consulting firms. And they have this very analytical process of going after each business case, trying to understand the market and trying to see if there is a successful story behind it, mm -hmm. and then picking up the one that has most promising. We didn't do that. Okay, no. but I think that also the case of you being also pregnant, that you did see that need, you had a problem that you wanted to solve for yourself mm -hmm. as well. And I think that's one of the best, so I mean, the best idea you can have when you also like yourself experiencing the problem that you would like to solve. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, you have the idea, um, and you have somehow the team. How did the team came together? Um, well, we started off in my living room, actually, with the baby you know, next to us. And um, we recruited the first students who helped us. We thought about the idea. We went out for investors, um, actually, already when I was pregnant. Just um, with an idea on paper? Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. That was what time, just approximately? It was shortly before I gave birth, and then we founded the company two days after. <laughs> <laughs> and and year 2007, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, for people like us, I mean, and maybe I'm, I'm the only one to think like this, but 2017 now, there's no way an investor is going to look at you if your idea is just on paper. Mm -hmm. Like, you need an MVP, you need a business case, you need to have already clients couple of dollars already of, uh, of revenue, mm -hmm. but with an idea and, and, and paper you actually went out and find investors? Yeah, we did, okay. but only because we convinced one big investor, which was Oliver Sandra, from the idea. There he looked at the idea and said, okay, this might work, uh, I'm going to get the money for you. Okay, I didn't know that actually Rocket Internet was invested into, into There network. was no Rocket Internet at that time. Okay, it was, so it was just him. The European <laughs> Founders Fund, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and, and the team, the two co-founders were friends from university or did you get to know them through mm -hmm. brainstorming across the years, networking or...? No, actually, my one co-founder was one of my best friends from university, um, and we also had we were working together in the same McKinsey office in Cologne, 
Um, and the third founder was a friend that we basically um, got to know at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. And in terms of team dynamics, did you feel like you had um, complementary skills? Or the friendship and the personality match was actually much more important for you? I think it, it is really a question about trust. Basically, you spend so much time as founders together that you really have to get along. And that was actually one of the issues we had as a founding team of three, that we were really close personally, us two, because we were friends, we knew each other, we already studied at university together. We knew actually every personality trait and every you know strength and weakness of the other person. And there was a certain level of trust so that you could also discuss very openly about things. And the third co-founder was a personality that did not match so well into that group. And I think that was also a core part why we broke up and continued as two founders and she did something else. And how did the breakup uh, was um, lived through by you, by the other co-founders? Is that Actually, that was really hard because of course it's a very emotional thing. You try to build up a company, you invest a lot of time, you actually want to invest all your energy in the company and not in sorting out all kinds of you know problems you have as a team. Personal. Yeah. So after a couple of weeks where we really saw that it's not going to lead us to a, a really joint adventure that we're going to have fun, we sat together and said, you know, this is not going to work. Let's think about it. How do we want to do it? And um, I think it's not, it was not a nice breakup, honestly. Um, but it led to a better solution for both sides. And, and was it shared by, by both sides, this, mm -hmm. this feeling that it, this didn't work out? Yes, I think so. Yes. Yeah, because I, I mean, team constellation is a, is a big criteria in the mm -hmm. make or break of a, of a startup Absolutely. at the very, very early, uh, early months. It's like a marriage. Years. I mean, <laughs> no, honestly, I think it's as important as a marriage because you spend really every day together. And if you don't like the other person, if you don't get along, it's not going to work. But it sounds easy when it's your your friend from university that you've been knowing for, for a long time. But I've seen also like a lot of uh, startups that um, where the founders have got to know um, each other through an event um, mm -hmm. and start building. And how do you actually assess this this very um, soft skill of like, is it going to be a good combination, not only complementary skills and analytics, but rather like on a personal level that you are actually going to match? I'm not sure if you really can do that if you only meet a person. I guess it's like marrying somebody you've just met. I mean, I'm not sure. If, a, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. B, if you think so it's... So you don't believe that love at first sight? No. <laughs> I met my husband when I was 17. <laughs> okay. No, I think it's... Um, of course, sometimes if... But you then have to know it's an adventure. And there's a big chance that it may be not work. But So you would prefer um, the team over the idea? Yes. So um, not rather cho choosing the, the, the idea because it sounds... Promising because the market is, is positive, uh, has positive yeah. signs, but rather the person behind. I would always look at the team first. And this is actually uh, what investors look at. Mm -hmm. They look at the team can always build another idea which will yeah. be also as great as the first one. The, yeah. the, 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 the idea will not survive the team if the team doesn't work. And you change your ideas actually quite quickly. I mean, if you develop a company, Basically, I'm not sure if any one of you has ever uh, done a business where you wrote a business plan, you had an idea, you got started. Usually you change the idea every six to 12 months. Some you might really adjust a little bit. Sometimes you just put it completely into the bin and start all over. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that no successful company has stick to the first idea they had. Yeah, you need to be adaptable yeah. and to people. And necessary. you need a team who can do that. Yeah. So looking at the idea, how does how did the, the first 100 day work? Um, you have the idea, so like, what's the first thing you do on a Monday morning to just execute on, on this idea? Well, we really started off with building a product directly. We were online, I think, after six to eight weeks. It was actually a ridiculous product, but we learned on the way. I mean, it was something we tried and we knew, okay, this is the first general problem we want to solve. Let's start off with that. And then we continue to learn with the users. And I think that was the only way, because if we would have tried to build a complete product, we for sure would have gotten 70 to 80% wrong. So you started with the first functionality or feature, which mm -hmm. was 
bringing on the one community topic or the community together? The idea was to build, basically build a Facebook for mothers. Facebook was just getting big at that time, it was pretty clear that the general idea really uh, appeals to people, that there is a need, and in Germany there were actually only editorial products at that time. Um, and we were sure that moms have this need to share about their kids, to basically get to know other mothers who might help them on their problems. And get to know is more than only having an editorial product or having a forum, as it's called in German, where you have just anonymous people exchanging ideas. So we started off with the profiles, basically, and the question and answer part of the product. And uh, how did you acquire the first members? Where, like, you guess, like, you built from friends who were also mm -hmm. mothers, but, like, how do you get traction when you're not known and, and social network are not as as, uh, as we actually as ran around all kinds of events you know convinced people to get active actually the biggest part was people to get active on the platform and then we started early on with online marketing especially google ads um, there was no facebook ads at that time so mm -hmm. we basically the biggest ramp up was with google ads which were much cheaper at that time and did you focus specifically on the, on the city um, at the beginning, or you were looking really at uh, the entire Germany? Um, actually, for our product, the cities were not really relevant. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we started in our area where we could reach people easily um, to convince them personally. But otherwise, online marketing-wise, it was actually most of the time moms who are not in big cities. Okay, so who felt a bit lonely and needed to talk to others. Yeah. So you didn't have any offline part, it was purely like the community bringing the content online, the user-generated content, I guess? No, or we also did some offline, but okay. not at the beginning, but we started off after a couple of weeks. Uh, we basically made flyers, went to all kinds of different um, locations, um, midwives, whatever, whoever we thought is a multiplicator for that. Mm -hmm. um, we recruited local moms, um, basically, who went out in the cities as ambassadors. Know, as ambassadors, who met yeah. others, who felt responsible for building up a community in that area. Um, and that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. So, and the product after a few weeks, what, how, did, how did it look like? What, what, what type of modules or features did you have? Was mm -hmm. it more like content-based editorial or are you also um, had a Q&A, you had an expert um, talking about specific issues that moms have when they are mm -hmm. pregnant or when they have to raise kids? Actually, we started off uh, by focusing on the community part. So we really focused on the profiles to make them nice, to make them be able to share photos and emotions and to exchange opinions on the questions and answers part and make mm -hmm. that very active because we felt that the need was rather entertainment and help and the feeling of community that you're not alone with those problems um, than really getting hardcore information. There were a lot of editorial offers, books, other web pages. That was not the need that we tried to fill at the beginning. We actually only started with editorial content because all the advertisers, when we were actually when we had to earn money, it was pretty sure yeah, that that's actually my next question. Yeah. Yeah. With the How community, you could not win advertisers. Advertisers are very conservative; they wanted to have an editorial page. So what did we do? We built the editorial page in front, which was actually on basically mostly for the advertisers, yeah. and the whole action was done in the community. Okay. And so the revenue streams that you were thinking of um, at the time, um, s thinking about starting with the community, monetization was not your priority, if I understood correctly, at the beginning. No, we, the first idea we had was, okay, if we have enough mobs on the page, we're going to find a model anyhow. Interesting that investors followed on that, but they did. And um, yes, we started off with advertising. Um, mm -hmm which went really badly after, at the beginning. Okay. But so for what reason? Because advertisers just didn't want to book communities. It was a brand they didn't know. Um, we started off working with the Spiegel in Germany, which helped us a lot because they gave us reputation and access to the biggest advertisers. Um, but, but how did you convince them? them? Like was, was it like a question of quantity? You needed to attain a certain mm -hmm. reach? 
uh, in your community? Was it about the quality of your of your network or the commonalities among your audience, like a very targeted audience mm -hmm. with moms? Um, it is a very special audience that a lot of advertisers really need to find. So that's a very good target group. But the core was basically, I went to every advertiser, I told our personal story, I convinced them to try it. It was, for a lot of them, it was rather a personal thing to say, okay, this is an interesting brand. I want to support somebody who's trying something new. Um, it was a lot of hard work going to every advertiser. And what, what was the key differentiating factor between those that said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with um, this website or, mm -hmm. and, and the others which were keen on, on trying or keen on, on giving you some, some advertising budget? I think the core was the positioning. We positioned NetMoms as a very emotional brand, as a brand that's very close to mothers, that in, in German talks in Du, not in Z, mm -hmm. which is way less formal and um, not that editorial, I'm the expert who's going to tell you what you're now supposed to do. And that was a positioning that was interesting for a lot of advertisers who did not feel that they are teaching people what to do, but that wanted to relate to somebody. And I think that was a core difference for them. And then we, of course, had to convince them with different kind of formats. We started off with Native, actually, in 2008, okay. by saying, okay, this play is not working with these customers. Let's really think about what can we do that creates value for them in this target so group. Maybe Let's define native advertising because I'm not sure the, our audience is very um, mm -hmm. expert on advertising in general. So what is native advertising? Native advertising um, is that you integrate into the content and into the functionality of, of pages, basically. So we really started off with having the editorial part and thinking about how can we put in advertisers intelligently so that they are at a point that really offers value to users. And not disrupting the... Not disrupting the experience. Um, also, what, what kind of offers are those users really interested? What do moms really want? They want to try products. They want to basically communicate with a brand. So we, we basically built all kinds of native formats and interactive formats that were completely new in that market at that time. And that's how you convince other adver advertisers to come in, and I yeah. guess then the investors. Yeah. So how many um, fundraising um, with the investors did you did you make? Uh, I think we made three rounds. Any, um, any challenges in that in that period of time? Like, if you were mother of how many kids at the time? Then? Well, changing <laughs> over time. <laughs> but um, but I had a baby every one and a half years, so. We went out for investors at the same time, it didn't really matter. Um, but we were really lucky because at that time we had around 18 months for a break even. And that was at a time actually where it was pretty sure afterwards we won't get money anymore. And we really hit that point um, because we were really profitable exactly at that part. If it would have been a couple months longer, we would have been bankrupt. So it's actually also a lot of luck as well. And that was due to the fact that you had reached um, a certain threshold in terms of reach and community and mm -hmm. at the same time convinced the advertisers on this new format that yeah. was coming up on that native advertising. Yeah. So how did you how did you motivate your, your investors? I think those that were existing were happy to stay on board. How did you actually get, well, then go to new investors? Actually, we didn't acquire too many new investors mm -hmm. anymore. It was always a group out of the old investors who invested again. Okay. And then after two years, we didn't need money anymore. We had enough cash, basically. It's a very nice <laughs> position. <laughs> Absolutely. And there were hard times in between. I mean, there was we got a Google penalty, I think, after three years. that basically killed all our traffic. And it was for three to six months. We had no idea if the traffic would come back from Google. What, what happened? What, well, we got a penalty for the site structure that we chose. And we figured that out after three to four weeks, basically. But then we had to change the structure and we had to wait for Google to basically put us back in the index. We had no idea if that, if that would happen, when it would happen. That was the time I really bet. But you didn't have <laughs> well. heads up from Google that that would happen? Or that no, they don't talk to you on that. It's just, you know... That happens. And then that you happens. Have to deal with it. Then you have to deal with it. Then you have to think about, you know, what could you change? What could be the reason? It's, of course, a bet. 
And, you have and to how did you find out? It's just that you didn't get any traffic anymore from coming from Google. Well, it basically was cut off from one day to the other, and then we ran out to everybody we knew who was a CEO, a specialist that we actually already worked on before. They looked, you know, what happened in the market, what kind of pages have been um, hit by this penalty, and from that we went backward and said, okay, if those pages were hit, we know it's going to be this common factor basically, and we chose the setup of the of the web page completely differently and then we waited. How long? Three months. Mm -hmm. Stress freaking out, I guess. Yeah, I basically my job was to go to all the advertisers saying no, it's gonna come back. I hope so. It's gonna come back and um, basically the product team was trying to solve the issue. And how do you motivate your team at that point to stay on board, to keep trying, to keep hoping? Basically, we didn't really have to motivate the people to stay on board because it was their product. They really wanted this product to succeed. It was not that you really had to convince somebody. They were all so busy solving this problem and keeping advertisers happy and basically working on it. They, I'm not sure they really had the time to think about that. Or maybe you in, in, install in a culture of, of bringing the organization together on one specific vision and goal, yeah. which was um, taken well, very, very to heart by your employees. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about other challenges that you had during, during that time? Um, and maybe also um, looking at um, your career and, and the, the launch with um, also balancing this with, a, with the family. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, I think the biggest, the first challenge was as we were three founders and didn't get along. I think that was the first one. I think the second one was we had no real experience with leadership and how to build up um, a, a bigger team. I mean, it was easy when you have two, three, four people, you really can talk to everybody basically on an hourly basis, but then you have to learn to manage 20 people, 30 people, and sometimes 40, 50 people. And that's not easy if you have nobody basically who can coach you on that uh, and we were both unexperienced in that it was a really learning process and if you would ask me i would do a lot of things completely different like what next time <laughs> <laughs> um i think another challenge was basically to change the business model regularly because we learned and every 12 to 18 months we had to really decide about changes strategic changes that were fundamental. And that was not easy to agree on that. I mean, we had discussions where basically the rest of the team thought this is the end of, of a friendship for sure. Because you were two and, and usually a team of two is very difficult to make a decision because you cannot find a consensus if both people are from different opinions. So how did you resolve this? Well, basically we had a clear, most of the time we agreed after a while or somebody was convinced. If not, we were sure about having certain competencies and if it was in the area of somebody else, you know, I gave my opinion or uh, Jens gave his opinion, but finally we, we agreed on, yes, it's your decision, you know. You've heard my points and we obviously don't agree. It's your decision, that's fine, we're going to take it. But who is making the last call then? Is that just because you were separating skills and domain and you had like very well defined the Mm -hmm. um, different topics that you would each cover and mm -hmm. therefore you would be responsible for the marketing advertising and you would have the last call on this one? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, I mean usually we agreed. There were not so many decisions yeah. where basically one of us had to take a decision. But there were a couple situations where we did not agree and then we trusted the other person that, you know, it's going to be okay and he's going to take this decision, that's fine. And sometimes we learned and corrected it again, but um, that was okay. I think we had a relationship or have a relationship that can take that and that can also take mistakes. Um, and then the, 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 the exit happens, um, I think 2012. Mm -hmm. You sold it to, to Boda for 2.5 million euro. Um, how does it feel? Why, why then? Why Boda? Uh, was, it, was it the right time? Do you, do you regret having it sold? Is there a right time? I'm not sure. We felt that we were at a point where that it was clear if we really want to grow the company, we would need to go international or we would need to invest more money. And it was not at a time where you would get a lot of new investors basically to invest in this business model. Um, so we said, okay, if we really want to 
either we can continue basically organically growing the company step by step, or we really need a bigger partner in this business. And um, we were both personally not in a situation where we wanted to run the company for the next 10 years on this level. Um, so we said, okay, let's basically find a good partner that helps us to grow this business and that gives us personally also more options to grow personally. So you were actively looking for, yes. for a partner. Yeah. And, and Boda came on board. How did the, the discussion um, started and, and the negotiation, I guess? Actually, we were already in negotiations with others and um, then it was a short, really short decision process on Boda's side. They came in actually close before assigning with another company and we said, you know, you only have four to six weeks now. Do you really want to enter into this process, yes or no? And with this close deadline, we pushed the process in four weeks. And you changed your mind and then yeah. went for Boda. We did. And so now you're at Boda um, for, the, for the past five years, um, um, going on this new role as a CEO of Boda Ford. How is um, how is your new role in more of a corporate environment uh, mm -hmm. different from what you experienced during your time as an entrepreneur? I think actually Boda Ford is an environment that's very entrepreneurial still, mm -hmm. but it's of course bigger. And for us, it was a need, after those years being able to take all the decisions, maybe after a discussion together. Um, it was of course a change again to have to discuss it with more stakeholders. Um, to not be able to say, let's do this and let's go here. Um, but we also learned that it's very valuable to have different people look on ideas again and to discuss things and to have a strong network of other publishing companies and other publishing teams that bring in all kinds of different experiences. Um, and it gave us personally more options to go into other topics, other teams, to learn more, to take on more responsibility as well. More aspiring partner to, yeah. to kind of um, check ideas. Yeah. And now you're responsible more of a, what we call the content marketing, so still in that direction of, of net, native advertising. Can you tell us what are the key industry trends that you see um, affecting this business or um, affecting publishing companies in general? Well, I think the first part is Google and Facebook taking strong shares of the market. They are strong distribution power in this market um, and move a lot of the direct entries that we historically had directly on our publishing offers to, for instance, the Facebook stream, to the Google search. Um, and it's very hard for us to build differentiating products afterwards and to basically keep control and not be to um, basically to not need them too strongly. I mean, the example of NetMom showed it, when Google changed the index, we dropped out, basically we almost lost all our business. So something I learned from there is to diversify and to try to have different kind of sources. That's mm -hmm. the first part. Um, and we see that through the whole market, also in the advertising industry, they're taking the whole growth right now in the advertising industry. And we have to change a lot as publishing businesses and we have to build more on technology to be able to differentiate. So I think the biggest things I see right now are personalization. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have been historically already very strong on some products we had, like NetMoms, where you really knew, okay, if your kid is in this age, I need this and this content pieces or offers. But also in the finance area, when I know somebody has different stocks in his, in his portfolio, I know what kind of news he needs. Um, and we need to be much smarter on that. We have a tradition as publishing companies to say, I define the agenda, I'm going to tell you what you're interested in, what are the trends. And we have to turn that around and learn from the user, basically, what he or she really wants to know, wants to learn, what is the problem I'm solving, and then go out and solve this problem. And to not only solve it with content or great content, I think that's something we can really do as publishing houses, but to also solve it with technology and the right products. And that's not part of the core DNA of the publishing industry. 
And how do you actually customize so much uh, the content to the user? Is that because you try to gather also like a lot of data and mm -hmm. try to, to have patterns, recognize patterns, recognize profiles to be able to, to bring the right content at the right moment, I assume mm -hmm. also? to the right person? Well, right now we're doing it very strongly on logins, but we have to become much smarter on data and to learn about the users, the user needs, how they move. But I think the whole industry is just starting on that. It has not been our core DNA, but we have to, and I think that's a core growth factor. Mm -hmm. um, so you're taking on this new role at, at uh, Boda, um, and um, you have now four kids. Um, how do you... What would be your um, kind of tips for female entrepreneurs who are trying to balance a great career and also a family? Do you at some point need to choose between the two? Apparently you didn't. <laughs> um, so do you think it's, it's easy to handle both or at some point you need a little bit of more focus on one and a little bit more focus on the other? Or do you need to be well, do you need to have like specific uh, prerequisites? So, be well accompanied, so have a, the right partner professionally and personally, mm -hmm. the right family environment. Well, I think you definitely need the right partner. That's the biggest career decision that you're going to make as a, as a female uh, leader. But basically, the core thing is not to think that strongly. This is a very female discussion we're having. You know, I always go out and ask, actually, all my male colleagues, they all have three, four kids. Nobody ever asks them what they do with their kids every day, you know? And but that's actually the, the right first partner. <laughs> do they have the right partner? Well, obviously they do. I mean, all of them have great, <laughs> great partners, actually. Um, There's always a woman behind a successful man. But I, I, I really sometimes, I have male colleagues who are really concerned about me and how we're doing it, but they're really surprised if you go back to them and ask them, what are you doing with your kids? It's like, oh, I've never been asked that before. <laughs> I think you first of all have to get rid of the whole expectation mm -hmm. thing and that's really hard but if you don't do that you have a block already in your head and I think you really have to try to solve this because all kinds of people have kids together it doesn't really you know block men of having a career or following on their passions and, and ideas, I think you can always solve it somehow. So it's basically getting rid of the cultural blockage, those that are being put by the society or... Uh, you won't change expect? society, but you can basically decide on how you get along with that. And I think if you as a couple are sure that you are okay with whatever you do, it's really easy to ignore everybody around. And that's important. I mean, you need the self-confidence to say, I really don't mind, for instance, if there are moms or, or fathers out there with you know, their kids playing soccer, and when they see me, they're like, oh, you're the mom. Yeah, <laughs> that's, you just have to get along with that. It shouldn't you know, bother you. Um, and I think it's also a great tip for entrepreneur female or, or male about their idea and not taking too much into account what other people Thank who are not necessarily experts tell them about their idea and how they're going to build a great company. Because there always, if you found a company, there will always be a lot of people who will tell you it's going to be a failure. You can be sure that's going to happen. And then to say, you know, whatever, there's no risk, I'm going to do it anyway, is a hard decision. So maybe a little bit over self-confidence is <laughs> helpful in the whole I agree. I'm going to open the, the floor for questions. Um, anyone would like to share some thoughts, opinions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that you were profitable after three years. Mm -hmm. is that, uh, was your business model to advertising or what was it about? Advertising. What's yeah. advertising? Mm -hmm. So um, when when Wood had joined, yeah, like when you were looking for a partner, um, how did that influence your business? Like, uh, was there a lot of interference uh, from Boda's side, or were, were you pretty much kept alone, or how did it work? Well, I think Boda has the DNA of having a strong profit center and entrepreneurial spirit, and I think 
that has of course strengths and weaknesses, but for us as founders, having sold a company, it was a great strength actually, because we had a lot of freedom on how we're gonna run the business. Of course, there were there was a sounding board, uh, there were stakeholders, um, but still, they believe strongly in, in a strong management and entrepreneurs. Okay. But of course, you have some regulations around it, and you have some people you have to discuss ideas with. I mean, but that's actually not a bad point. Sometimes it's good to reflect on what you're doing, as long as it doesn't take up, you know, all of your time to justify what you really would love to do. And, and how did it work on an operational base? Like, uh, were you directly in the beginning confronted with like, okay, now you're gonna be you know, uh, connected to our SAP system and, and like we're going to do your bureaucracy or uh, like, like, like how did it go or were you pretty much really kept alone and from time to time you had, you had to do some reports or? Yeah, actually um, we didn't feel that too much. I mean there is a, a big part which is a service center at Borda that is doing um, the whole bookkeeping, SAP thing. But we didn't feel that that much because it was basically done by the um, the parent company, and we had a really high. I mean, we had to report every three months, um, but I think that was doable, and we were able to define how we want to do this kind of you know appointments. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did you uh, did you or do you have any any sort of um, like moral code? What's what's uh, in regards to um, the advertiser, so for example, that you wouldn't advertise for, I don't know, Milchschnitte or some bullshit? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, there were, <laughs> yeah, no, that's absolutely a good question. I think it's very important if you have a, a, a brand and you want to have a brand that's trustworthy, there are always some advertising partners, especially if you want to do native advertising, mm -hmm. that you really should keep far away. For instance, um, I'm not sure how it's called in English, Nabelschnurblutbanken, that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's stuff where I really personally don't believe in, and I think it's, it's, I mean, I would never recommend that to a friend, and I just had a moral issue with putting advertising on the page that is integrated into the editorial part. There are all kinds of, Mischnitte, I think, would not be a good product to do native advertising with. Um, so it has to be something that you really think you can recommend to users and otherwise I would maybe take it as a display app which is basically differentiated and you can see it is an advertising, it's not okay. integrated in the page. Okay, so you would take it as an advertisement if that's obvious labeled as advertising? Yeah. Okay, but you wouldn't do it as a... But I would never integrate it in the page nice. or... Yeah. Very we were talking about strategic changes. Um, what were the biggest you had in the right The biggest strategic changes we had? Um, I think the biggest strategic move was, let me think, we had a couple. Well, the first one was to realize that for advertising, we need to build up editorial. I think that was the first strategic move because it was a completely different focus of the organization. Um, I think the second big move was when we we found it actually two other companies on the way. One was a shopping um, website which was called Shoparella, which aggregated all kinds of different shops for for moms um, and um, we learned that it didn't work well with our page. That was the next move to say, okay, we're not going to go into shopping obviously then. And then we started all kinds of different transactional models and, and tried different, different kind of tests until we founded a service which was called Fembooks that was um, an offer where you could build your own photo products which is like a scrapbooking, an online scrapbooking. Uh, this kind of, we tried all kinds of different things basically, what kind of models work additional to advertising and, and tried that. For your community? Yeah. Targeting the same community, so mm -hmm. like cross promotion of yeah. different other things. But usually, we try things then, and then you know, we figured out okay, is it gonna be a way that we want to follow or not? But at least every eighteen months, we had to change the model. And if you say you changed your revenue stream to basically every eighteen months, how did your investors react? And like, did they get nervous? Did they support you? 
we didn't change the revenue streams, but we changed how we thought about the product, how we thought about the users. Sometimes we tried different kind of revenue streams as well. Um, but it's always basically changing the core focus of the team. Maybe finding different people, you know, that you needed. Um, also cutting off some projects that you followed. For instance, we cut off part of the community because it didn't work. This kind of decisions. How big was the team when you, when you left? Um, when we sold the company, I think it was 30 um, full-time employees and another 15 part-time helps. A lot of moms basically helping us um, on the page that we paid hourly, for instance. And, and that team um, stayed afterwards mm -hmm. at, at Boda? Yeah. How, how did the culture change or how did you motivate them to actually stay with a, a large organization? Um, I think they're really deeply dedicated to the product and they love working for this product and it's a team that has been working together for years and they're really close friends. Um, so I think it's a very strong culture and that continued even after we step by step left the company or moved on. Mm -hmm. It's still a core team that has been there now for almost 10 years um, that just loves the product and likes to do that. So you ma managed to maintain the, the, the vision and the culture, although you were part of a bigger organization. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Yeah. So when you went out for funding, how did you know? How did you know how much to ask, or how did you did those negotiations? Actually, we took all the money we could get. <laughs> it's very simple. Um, and. What was the second part of your question? Yeah, like how do you did those negotiations? Evaluation. Yeah, evaluation, yeah. Evaluation. Um, actually, the first one was something that was a suggestion by Oliver Sommer, who's really simple, like, yeah, I like the idea, you're going to get this money for this, and take it or leave it. <laughs> no big negotiation. Um, the second and third round was rather more negotiation, where we came up with a suggestion and... Um, but basically it's a lot about what do we think can we ask for in the market and what do we think where the business can grow to and it's not calculating big... it was not at that time at least, or for the investors we had, to calculate huge models or business plans that are really detailed. It was rather, do they believe in the idea? Do they think that's going to be an interesting model or a potential exit? And then it was no, no big discussion, rather just I'm in or I'm out. But I'm not sure if that's complete... I mean... <laughs> No idea. I'm pretty sure. Actually, it has changed a lot, and it's very different depending on who you talk to. Um, yeah, I think it has yeah. also changed quite a lot. Now, yeah. then, the business plan model with a thousand mm -hmm. rows to explain uh, a company that is uh, just maybe six months old. So. But I always have the question: Does really Excel tell you to make a decision, yes or no, or is it the question: Do I really solve a problem for somebody, and if? I think it's true. I think it's you solve a problem for somebody, and I think it's the connection you have with the founders. And as yeah. you said earlier, the team makes it quite um, a, a very large criteria of the decision making process of an investor. Do I believe in the team? And if I believe in the team, do I believe in the idea? If, or if I don't believe in the idea, can they make up for another idea which will, they will yes. be successful with? So, why look at an Excel sheet? I mean, I can basically model you everything you want in Excel. If I learn something in consulting, then this. <laughs> and, and doing poor representation. <laughs> Maybe it's an IQ test. Can they model it? Yes or no one? Do they actually grasp their numbers and do they understand yeah. what they are talking about that's in terms of market do. sizing and market share when they build up uh, an exponential growth? I guess that's, that's kind of the reality check that they need. Yeah, but that's not my interview. So. What about the people acquiring the company? Don't they have to look at the finances? Like? Yeah, I mean, of course they did a due diligence. You know, is legally everything all right, financially, yes. Um, I think that's not about decision. Uh, actually, I that think point. a yes or no decision is finally gut feeling because even if you show me all the numbers that I think look fantastic in Excel, 
it's not going to be the core part of my decision or if anybody else's, I'm pretty sure. If the gut feeling is not right, nothing else will support it. I understand for that from the farmers, but... No, I'm also talking investors. I would never invest into a company where I don't have a good gut feeling. But somebody acquiring your company, that's not an investor anymore. That's somebody who actually is buying your company. I'm not looking as a company at other companies that we might buy. And if I don't have the gut feeling that this is a good strategic match, that it's a great team that we want to have, that the technology is right, you can show me every Excel sheet you want. I would never buy this company if those three things aren't there. And that's sure maybe we're talking. And I think it's even... Well, I understand for investors investing in the company. But for, in the case of Buddha buying your company, I think there was more than just a gut decision. Julia can maybe answer that, weren't you there at that time? <laughs> or maybe not, maybe it was just a gut decision, I don't know. Uh, pretty sure it was pretty gutty. <laughs> I also think it's about what you're going to do with that company once it's uh, inside your organization and the type of synergies that you can bring by combining the two. So it's, it's, is, it, is it a business that is very complementary to my business? So of course it's not just to get feeling, but there is a lot more than just an Excel spreadsheet. And that brings me to actually my last question. Um, where do you invest your money? Like if investors, if, if entrepreneurs come to you now um, and would like to spark your interest, um, what would you look at? What type of industries, what type of, of criteria would you actually look at when, when you do small investments for in startups? I think the first question I would always ask myself is, you know, I think I mentioned it already, what kind of problem do you solve? Is there, you know, if that's really something that's sparkling, that you really say, okay, well, yeah, that's a problem I can relate to, and I get the feeling how they're going to solve it. Um, are they working on the right problem? Um, I think that's the first thing. If, if that doesn't convince me, I would never invest money into anything. Um, and actually, it's very interesting that a lot of companies don't really answer this question. They have all kinds of different uh, ideas, but they don't really, they're not, able to tell me, in a nutshell, what is the problem they solve. And I think that has to be the first and the last question I answer every day. You've heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks not, a lot. Not, Don't, you want just, to have... not every company is solving a problem, because otherwise... Well, then they're not as successful, for sure. Yeah, but you would only have one car company. If, you, if it's just about solving the problem, you would only have one car company. You would only have one okay. building company. What job do you want to do? What is the job that you're doing for somebody? Usually it's solving a problem. Yeah, you somehow solve a problem. For instance, if you're buying a Porsche, you're probably a middle-aged guy who wants to impress women. That's your problem. <laughs> you're solving it, okay? <laughs> no, really, ask the question, what, what am I solving in somebody? What, what is the issue or the job you're doing for this person? There's actually a very interesting talk um, of a marketing Harvard professor who asks, what job is this milkshake doing? If you would say, well, this is a milkshake, I'm probably going to drink it because I, I'm hungry and, you know, I want something because I like chocolate milkshake. But that's not the job usually milkshake does. Most of the people buy a milkshake because they're on their way to their office and they have time to drink, they're bored in the car, they buy a milkshake because that's something they can basically drink in the car and not get messy. You know, it's not like they're buying something that basically becomes them all full, it's not something big, that's the job a milkshake solves. And I think that has to be the first question you always ask when you found, when you do a company, if you do a web page, what is it you want to solve for somebody? Why should the why question? Why should somebody go there? Why should somebody use it? And it's interesting that a lot of companies don't answer this question. Thanks a lot, Tanya, for being here tonight and um, for relating your journey about Netman. So big applause, um, please.
think we have a little something um, for you. We do. Um, Sonia, <laughs> thank, thank you so yeah. very much for taking the time sharing your very inspiring story with thank us. You. We all appreciated it. We all really liked it. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you. you came from Cologne. You skipped a private meeting tonight. So all I the brought them along. That's <laughs> right. You brought them along. Which you're very happy about. So thanks for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would also like to thank actually Borda uh, for having us uh, today here and for all the organization behind it. So Lisa, uh, thanks a lot for making this happen. Uh, thanks for coming guys and it's not over. We still have a lot of drinks and food so please stay, mingle, have some drinks and Tanya you're going to stay with us a little bit so you can ask also all the confidential questions you didn't want to, want to ask during uh, the interview uh, now. <laughs> Thanks a lot for coming, guys. Thanks. Bye.